Hi guys, it's Celine. It's Tuesday. Again. How many times have I said that? This year? Well, today is the 2nd of February, so maybe I've said it four times, actually. Um, it's been weird. <laughs> Again. I mean, I don't want to do this. I, want, I don't want things to be this weird, necessarily. There have been... Uh, Sort of things, you know, when sometimes you have things that happen and then the next day, next day other things happen and it's like everything sort of ties in with each other the whole time. I don't know if I'm making sense at all. I don't know if I'm, if I'm actually properly awake here because I've been inside the house and you know how it is, right? Ah, I just get fed up with being inside anyway. Um, in chronological order, it would mean for me that I watched videos about, um, the Thoth Tarot, which is this one. I actually got uh, a copy of that deck at a uh, very reasonable price. The, uh, it's not secondhand, it looks a bit secondhand, but it was just a very old copy that sat in the shop for a very long time. I watched... Um, in particular, videos about the artist who drew these cards. So this is a tarot deck, if, uh, you know, somebody out there doesn't know it, um, that is quite different from what most people are comfortable working with. I'll uh, just show you a few cards here. This is uh, the lover's card, for example. There's a degree of, I don't know, formality, I suppose. Um, pippish, you know, structures, that type of thing. Uh, the cups cards are the least exclusively pippish in the sense that they have more, um, more going on with flowers and stuff. It's very arty in a way and I personally like this because it is different I tend to my tarot collection tends to be very much all over the place if things are expressive I will be interested it doesn't matter exactly what type this is another example of the formality of this of this deck is that the high priestess no this is actually justice there's quite a number of cards that look like this. It has a certain, not all the cards are the same type, but these have, to me, they look a bit um, like uh, church windows, you know, colored glass, very much set in, be because of the geometric, geometrical uh, patterns that's going on in there. They're not all the same. Some of them are more fluid and um, it's an interesting deck to work with. I haven't really pulled cards from this very often. I do occasionally, but not all the time. And it's not one of the decks that I use uh, really easily. Um, but I'm not scared of it anymore either. I used to be scared because of the whole not knowing anything about it, really. Um, you know, about the creator of the deck or the the person who was the advisor behind the scenes, basically. Um, just like with the Rider Waite tarot, I'm thinking that this should be called the Frida Harris tarot <laughs> myself instead of Alistair Crowley. She didn't want that herself. She didn't want the notoriety or the fame or any of it, but she did all the work. And it turns out she was a Freemason, actually. I will uh, put the link... Uh, to the video that I watched, which has all the intel in the description down here. Um, it was where I found uh, some of her earlier drawings when she was, um, you know, studying to be a mason. And there's drawings and paintings, something like this, or like this, which is a very traditional type, masonic type painting. I'm interested to the extent that a lot of this symbolism is quite recognisable to people who work with tarot a lot. Some of it is less recognisable. There's also alternatives on the net uh, to the cards that she actually did put in the deck. So she made, often she made several 
um, you know, paintings before Crowley was actually satisfied, you know, or before she herself was satisfied, I wouldn't know. These are two um, alternative, the colors are actually more or less like this, even though the lighting is horrible down here at the moment. Uh, that's a moon card over there. The, the card in the deck actually resembles this quite a bit and also not so much. So the colors are quite different, but the shapes with the two uh, Egyptian gods on either side looking towards each other. It's like a, like a gate in, uh, like for example, in the never ending story, there's also a gate with sphinxes on either side. Yeah, that kind of a thing. So I'm suddenly reminded of that long, rambly, winding tail here. Uh, these are alternative cards. What I was really interested in at the moment are these two. These are two of her drawings and I'm just showing them to you if you're really interested in Lady Frieda Harris's artwork. I can, uh, of course, put another uh, link uh, down below to a page that has these where you can actually properly look at them. I'm just showing these to you because I'm going to cut these out and paste them on cardboard, you know, in a nice way to keep with my uh, Thoth deck here in its bag. And I just thought that would be really nice to have those. What I didn't expect was for this card here, or this image, I should say, to have to obtain all of a sudden a lot more significance for me personally. So this is a... It's a really weird picture, and it's actually in its basis, I suppose, in the middle there, what you see is like a sort of a portal. It's a coffin type shape over here with uh, like a portal in it with two columns and a checker, checkered pattern black and white floor like that. Those same elements can be found in this one. This is a sort of a traditional Masonic painting that they use in, in rituals. I don't know how, I suppose most of, most of that is really secret. This is a very original version of that type of painting though, because it has um, at the top here, I have to look into the whole symbolism of this painting and exactly what it means and why this is why she did things this way uh, still, because I haven't had the time to do that. At the top here is a skull and crossbones. And if you look close enough, you see the skull and crossbones pattern repeated on each of those facets of what looks like a big quartz kind of a crystal. <laughs> so that was all very nice and interesting, you know, if you're interested in Lady Frida Harris and the Thoth Tarot, or more or less, you know. Well, it just sort of interwove into my personal life all of a sudden, is that um, last Sunday, so two days ago, my husband talked to me about a video he had seen, an animation, shortish video about a boy who gets dropped off uh, at an orphanage by his dad. And I was watching that and it was like six minutes worth or so and I was bawling because orphans and you know, relatable kind of a thing. And I said to him, please don't ever talk to me about orphans and orphanages again. <laughs> After which we had dinner and then went to the telly to watch uh, Pirates of the Caribbean number four, I think it is, Salazar's Revenge, which I enjoyed thoroughly, except for the fact that there was another, this time a female child, Drops off at an orphanage by her father. So, spoiler, I won't go into any more of the detail because if you haven't seen the movie and it's something you want to see, this is just a tiny, teeny element. So, here I was again. <laughs> I wasn't bawling anymore, but I was really upset. And for some reason, this whole idea of your real parents... I mean, I grew up with my real parents up until uh, I was six and a half or so. Then there was an intermezzo where I, which I spent at a foster, kind of a foster family, which was more or less informally arranged by my granddad. And after five months, I got kidnapped from there by my mom, 
with a friend of hers who had a car and they uh, took me with them. And afterwards I was uh, formally adopted again. What's the, what's the word? I don't know. Uh, got My mother got custody of me officially. And by that time I was like seven and a bit. So the whole orphanage thing isn't really what strikes me so much. It is that my both my parents had very screwed up lives themselves and they had uh, lots of problems and lots of ways where they couldn't really interact with me at all. And that still hurts me every day as I sit here. It's amazing how deep the wound really lies when you're surrounded by people with big problems when you're an infant it just doesn't go away it never really goes away so I was getting upset about that again and feeling looking at the sparrows I've got a ton of sparrows because I put bird feed out in the garden mm -hmm. in the yard and uh, so now they're all at it all of a sudden I've got 20 sparrows and a pigeon so it's what it looks like. There was a, a robin there as well, a red breast bird. Um, I'm distracted by the birds now because I don't want to think about this stuff. I don't want to be miserable and think about my parents again and, you know, deconditioning from parental beliefs and all that stuff. It's all important, it's all relevant, so hence the videos. This morning, very early, actually, in the still more or less in night time, you know, before six o'clock, I think, I woke up to go to the loo and I had like, um, I don't know, I was miserable again over this whole thing and basically looking towards my parents to help me to, as a, as a child will, you know, expecting my parents to step up, expecting them and it was what make was what was making me miserable. It was what was making me miserable. That's the sentence right there. Because I expected them to be something they couldn't be, really, which is very normal. And this happens the whole time, right? Not just to me. I what did I do exactly? I suppose I went to the other room and pulled a few cards and had an aspirin because of headache and things. And in the end, I picked up my Illustial Crystal and I should have sh should have brought it to show you to you. An Illustial is a quartz. Mine is a citrine plus smoky quartz. Anyway, um, greyish, pale yellow type colour. It looks very distorted and it's got all sorts of facets and sides and lines where it was... It looks like a crystal that was broken and healed again, you know, in its um, solution where it actually grew in the earth. And it's a very special crystal to me. And I had been, before picking up the crystal, I had been sort of realizing, especially what with my two more practice going on, you know, more or less at continually the whole time at a you know, moderate level, um, feeling that I'm making slow, steady progress in terms of TUMO. I will get back to that in another video soon, I suppose, whenever I have something really significant to report. I was realizing that my experiences with my soul retrieval, you know, part inside, reintegrating the part of me that I found during this whole soul retrieval experience, uh, that that was actually, I could feel more and more and clearer and clearer that that is, it's a connection that gave me peace and love for the first time in my life. And I have been at it since by now five and a half years since that experience really grounded in me and I really got connected with that part of myself that I had lost. Um, whatever it is that it really means, whether it's actually what it feels like is a soul retrieval experience with a soul part that broke off from who I am supposed to be 
in the 14th century somewhere in France in I don't know you know that's what it feels like and it feels like she died in in a dungeon somewhere in childbirth and especially the sensations around the childbearing the underbelly type sensations are quite strong there it, it doesn't make me feel pain or sickness so much as that it is there it is very very present in the whole in the whole experience and if i connect with that funnily enough rather than getting all sorts of dramatic uh resistance and pain and anger and sadness and whatever you would think comes with that type of legacy if you like this type of uh, of, of, of of event happening instead of that what I get is peace and love and that's extraordinary and it just feels beautiful and extraordinary to be with her whatever it was that she went through so I had made the choice early this night right now uh, earlier today if you like in the middle of the darkness to instead of focusing on my parents and how they messed up and all that you know and what they were like and how how hard it was for them and that they couldn't help it and la 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 endlessly those same types of stories instead of that i went back to my soul retrieval my soul healing reconnecting story there which is difficult because it is a lot less material it is not something i've physically experienced except in the way I'm telling it to you right now. So it's very different from living in a particular place with a person, going to school there, meeting with this, that and the other friends and per people, having relatives do this, that or the other. Those are very connectable, easily, you know, manageable data, I suppose. This type of the soul retrieval data is very specific very limited for me i'm just telling you how i've been going through this okay um very specific very limited very consistent always like this always the same and it's actually only now only recently that i've been realizing that what she gives me this person who i might may have been that I have very little information about other than that she was an outcast. She did not belong in the society that she lived in. So she may have been a traveler. That's what I, what it feels like to me. Um, one of her tribe of travelers who landed in the south of France around that time, uh, around, uh, around the 1400s is a possibility, is what I have encountered. There's uh, videos about that in more detail in my uh, playlist about uh, past lives as well on my channel. Um, I've lost the beginning of my sentence now. But other than that, I don't really know much about this except for how it makes me feel. And it's only now, that's what I was saying, that I realize that, I have, that she gives me peace. She reconnecting with this person that I have been apparently or that is a part of me has been that I need to be complete as a human that that um, that's only that only happens with her and she gives me peace inside inner peace which is fantastic so what I did is I had um, picked up my celestial crystal, like I said just now. And because I kind of felt that it was going to transform the process again. And I cannot t say really more than that at this point. I can't really explain what it was that happened. Except that I felt very often using celestial crystals to be uh, it detoxifies the body so you ma must make sure that you drink enough water otherwise they may certainly give you a headache or something like that or uh, other you know toxin problems um 
it's kind of a an celestial is like a, a white light carrier in a way it, it's a very strong very powerful healing crystal and it depends a bit it's a an celestial is in fact a crystalline type where there's multiple layers of quartzes on top of each other so there has been melting going on at one point and then recrystallizing so you get these weird wonky crystals and often uh, sometimes they're called crocodile quartz as well where there's one or several sides of the of the stone of the of the rock that you're holding that show uh, crystalline shapes that look like scales of a crocodile skin you know like dig 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 repetitive uh, similar shapes like that you're larger and smaller it's a really beautiful type of crystal mine doesn't have that um, but it, I have shown it on my channel before, so if you're really fascinated, you can always try and find Lestil in the playlist down somewhere. <laughs> I haven't got any separate playlists about crystals. Maybe I should. Um, mine has not got the crocodile uh, effect that much. It has one side of the of the shape. It's about this this size, like this, uh, that has a very strong etching on it, and those are supposed to represent other properties and other potential potential for spiritual growth and ascension and whatever you know i'm not well versed into that and etching uh for you know on a quartz crystal like that it, it looks something like this like that so almost like writing it's almost like it has a meaning of some sort except it's pure nature so um i don't know whether this uh, recent this morning's kind of a uh, happening the, whatever it was that happened i think it brought me a lot closer to choosing what my soul soul retrieval brings me choosing that part in my life rather than believing in what people even less than i already did you know it's not that i don't care anymore it's that whatever has happened to this body because of those people, it's only part of a long, long series of chains of events. And my parents of this body are only part of a long series. And that's the perspective I am getting, I think, from this from this work with this celestial crystal at that point. So that's maybe that's what I was trying to say here, actually. It feels like the celestial markings, the etchings on the celestial crystal like that. It won't focus, of course. But maybe you can still sort of make out what that looks like. Um, each of those pins represents a spike of consciousness for some reason. You know, uh, a, a, a level of awareness that you're getting at. And they're connected at the bottom or halfway in somewhere. They're all connected. It's really hard to explain what it feels like. And it feels really good and it feels peaceful. So it's like the peace I had that I noticed this morning, early in the night, sitting there with my problems and my soul retrieval experience and my memories of all that. And realizing that there has only ever really been peace for me personally with her, with this part of me, together with her. Uh, it has kind of crystallized out, if you like, with my celestial, with that. And I thought it was pretty extraordinary that I was watching a pirate's movie, which is full of skulls and crossbones, you know, and then encountering this drawing by Lady Frida Harris, which has a crystal version of the world, if you like, where all these perspectives, you might think that all these sides, I hope you can see that these are like sides to of a large quartz, like that. And each side has different little images in it, and I have to study all that still, like I said. 
but they, it's like all those perspectives. It's like, except they're not mind perspectives only. They're self perspectives. And that's what you really are. And that's what the celestial is about. Sorry for the darkness. It's apparently getting really dark now. <laughs> perspectives as you learn, as you, as you live those lives. And I thought that was an encouraging thought. To, for me, I was, it made me instantly really happy to remember this morning as I was lying in my bed with my crystal like that. I was suddenly going, wow. And I was looking at this drawing and it has the, the, the skull and crossbones and how much, how much do things come together here? I mean, it's the movies, it's the orphanage bit, it's the, all of it, you know? It's really, huh. <laughs> I mean, even for me. And we're having those, we're having those kinds of things at the moment. We're having those things all the time. I don't know how it's going your end, but I am having those synchronicity things. I, I always, you know, tend to go like, eh, you know, <laughs> please. <laughs> I will, you know, but this is just like, it just keeps piling up in on the synchronicities and it's very humorous and very and it's healing and I feel good about this I feel good about this peaceful perspective that I'm getting nowadays so yay I mean um yeah maybe it's time it has been feeling all over January really like uh very slowly progressing you know grindingly slowly especially after the um the new moon halfway through january that was tough for both of us and then afterwards it has uh, been feeling like it's finally calming down in the stars and the planets and all that and the moon and this morning when i had my event with this crystal and all that the moon was sitting on my personal ascendant at eight um, eight and a half degrees of Libra. Spot on there. On the dot. So, and that's been happening a number of times. If you know where your ascendant is and know what the moon is, where the moon is at and what they're doing, you know, and <laughs> you can, you may be slightly better prepared for the weirdness that's uh, coming your way. If that's your life, I don't know. I know a lot more people are having weird lives at the moment, so. Good luck with um, whatever that is. Have courage, because I believe that fear and courage come in equal proportions to us. So if we only choose to, you know, incorporate courage as well. There's, there's loads more courage, especially if there's lots of fear. My card of the day in the Musha, the Nine of Swords. But this links up totally with the whole orphanage business and the whole business of uh, feeling like my parents only knew how to shout at me, which I am certainly not the only one to have uh, had that kind of an experience. So I'm sticking the Nine of Swords proudly there on my table. I'm not scared of the Nine of Swords anymore. So yay for me. Thank you for watching. Bless you. And um, I'm hoping to see you uh, quite soon again. I have no idea. Maybe when uh, these are finished, uh, you know, gluing and pasting. And... Um, I can show it to you when what it looks like together with the Thoth uh, deck. Just as a, you know, just as a, a pretty fire. Just for that. For no other reason than also to uh, pay my homage to Lady Frida, who was really good at this at this job. If you, uh, jeez, wow, yes. So admiring here. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.